Hello, and thank you for joining us for our annual video series from the International Symposium on Human Identification. Today, we're speaking with Colleen Fitzpatrick. Colleen, why don't you start out by telling the viewers a little bit about yourself? Yes, I'm Colleen Fitzpatrick. I'm the uh, founder of Identifinders International. Um, we were founded to use genetic genealogy toward forensic work. We were founded 2010 and 2011. At that time, you could only use Y-DNA for this purpose, you know, comparing a Y profile from a crime scene to the genetic genealogy Y-SDR databases. And we did very well. We did the Sarah Yarbrough case, which was the first case ever to use genetic genealogy as an investigative lead. And we were the first to solve a case using genetic genealogy. And that was the Phoenix Canal murders. And for both of those, we've got, we placed as a finalist for Cold Case Hit of the Year. Well, we enjoy talking to you every year. You are a repeat uh, a participant for us. Thank you so much. It's always exciting to see what you've been working on lately. And this year you presented about a new think tank, OCIG. Can you tell us what OCIG is and what they're doing? Um, you know, OCIG, it's a much longer, you know, name, but we call it OCIG. And the reason we founded that is a group of us was really thinking that there's no real one place to go for us to discuss genetic genealogy, to teach each other, to, you know, uh, you know, to learn what it's all about. And I, I was, I feel like we're getting past the, oh my God era where, you know, oh my God, there's another case being solved. You know, you know, we're getting into the era where we really need to understand that this is a tool. Uh, it has its advantages, it has its disadvantages, it has its limits of application, you know. So we need to come to an understanding of the practicalities of the tool. And that's why we founded it, to provide a forum where we can all learn and discuss that. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, it's interesting to hear the impetus for it and how it started. How do you think it's going to help the field of forensic genealogy grow and move forward? As we become more familiar with the pluses, minuses, that's going to educate us on how to use the tool most efficiently. Where it can be applied, where it can't be applied, it's going to make it more cost effective and it's going to streamline the process. Fantastic. How can current forensic professionals get involved or leverage the work you're doing? What's their connection to it? I would suggest that people go to the OSIG website, osig.org, um, sign up, become a member of the group. It's free. Sign up, post some comments in the forum, post your questions. What are you most concerned about? What do you want to know? What do you want to connect on? What are the issues you see? And how can you apply it to your cases? So, you know, go sign up, become part of this discussion in this education process. We also post new news items on our homepage. So if you have something you think is very exciting or, you know, interesting, a groundbreaking case, you know, you can email me at colleen at osig.org or colleen at identifinders.org. You can get a hold of me and we'll consider that. We're not looking for articles that, you know, uh, let's say, uh, prioritize one company over the other or, you know, showcase anything. We're after just understanding and how it works. Is it a case that otherwise couldn't have been solved? What are the issues you had to face to get past that? That's what we're after, a real solid discussion and not so much, you know, just publicizing cases that were solved just to publicize they were solved. We need to know how that happened. You know, along those lines, I'd love to talk more about some of the cases that you mentioned, like your work on the, the homicide of Sarah Yarbrough. What made that so significant? What, what, if you can tell us a little bit about that case, I think it'd be very interesting. Uh, that was an amazing case. Uh, I actually started working on it in 2011. I went to Seattle for a genealogy conference and I went a day early and talked to the Seattle Police Department about using Y-DNA, Y-STR databases, genetic genealogy databases. And they didn't really take to it, you know, they didn't really get it. But the DNA lady was there uh, who was the head of the DNA lab and she understood. And so six months later, she put me in touch with the detectives. Now, a very interesting story maybe for next year's issue, but to get to the point is, um, you know, the Y DNA indicated a name, et cetera. Very interesting story. But after a while, the leads ran out. 
So we went back in, I think, 2019, and we did it with autosomal DNA. It took us only a few weeks, the SNP testing, and we were able to solve it then. And then we discovered the issues turned up that this guy had been arrested for first degree rape in the 80s before CODIS came along. So he actually owed his DNA, which was never collected. And then uh, after the murder in the mid 90s, his brother, no, he was arrested for child molestation, but he pled down. So he didn't have to give his DNA. So he got out of it, out of CODIS again. It could have been solved within two or three years and it didn't happen. And then recently his brother was arrested for first degree rape. So if Washington state was a familial search state, they would have got him a third time. So all in all, he just, you know, dodged the bullet uh, three times legally. And I want to say the original name we came up with was not his last name because his grandfather had been adopted back in 1910. So even genetic genealogy had that certain loophole, you know, but so that's why it was significant that we finally identified him. And I want to say the Seattle Police Department, the uh, King County Sheriff were absolutely amazing. The minute we gave them that name, I think it was two brothers, the minute we gave them, they got out of their chairs and raced you know, to collect that DNA and figure it out, they were wonderful. Wow, that's an amazing story too about the many paths to solving a case and how when you, you know, uh, hit a dead end with one, you can move to the next and the next and the next and solve those cold cases, which you are expert at, so. <laughs> By now, I should be. <laughs> Speaking of, is there anything you're working on now you can talk about? Give us a preview for next year. Uh, well, you know, I really can't, you know, the agencies hesitate to publicize things, but we are working on some cases from the 50s, maybe 60s, some really old ones, as well as the new ones. I want to emphasize too, in all of this, that we talk about, oh, they solved another cold case. But what we really aim with OSIG is to get the genetic genealogy in the pipeline at the beginning. Make sure when you make those decisions, are we going to go forward with this case with DNA? Don't just think about CODIS from the beginning. Even recent cases can use this. Really, you should do CODIS first, you know, because that's the standard that's been around 30 years. That's a legal form of identification. If you can solve it using CODIS, you're done. Okay, great. But if you can't, make sure you have that DNA or that maybe that, that SNP set available so you fall back on genetic genealogy. Uh, and, and you can complement what you're doing at the moment. You don't have to say, oh, it didn't work with CODIS. Let's go get some more DNA. Let's go extract. Let's think about, do we want to do genetic? Do all of those decisions right at the beginning for the new cases, not just the cold cases that have been through the ringer for years and haven't produced anything. This is a modern tool. Let's use it for modern cases. You know, you have, um... You've been in the news a lot. You've worked on some very high profile cases. When you started working in genetic genealogy, did you have any idea where this was going to go? I mean, what have the last couple of years looked like for you? You know, I'm very happy about the last couple of years. I'll tell you, at first, when I was involved in the Sarah Yarborough case, of course, I'm looking for matches to the genetic genealogy databases. And I came up with the name Fuller, which was connected to the Fullers on the Mayflower, you know, collateral line. And so the genetic genealogy people were, I got, you know, hate mail, I got negative comments. And to me, it was emotional reaction. You know, of course, we want these people off the street, but it was the first time and people were like, I don't know, oh my God, does Big Brother have my data? I was using publicly available data, okay, but it was an emotional reaction. So now I'm very happy because of all the stuff like the Golden State Killer, you know, we have to really think now. We can't react and say, I don't want, I don't want you to use my data to get the Golden State Killer off the street. No, I'd rather... You know, it's a more serious discussion and I'm very happy, even with people that disagree. I'm glad they have reasons for disagreeing and they're not just, you know, blasting, oh my God, you know, we're gonna get past the oh my God era in that respect as well. We're gonna talk about it, we're gonna iron out the issues and we're gonna use the tool in an efficient and, and cost-effective manner. It has been vibrant discussion and you can really see the field mature. Yes, I'm yeah. very happy, even if people disagree with me, I'm glad for the discussion. It didn't, it wasn't always that way. No, I mean, it's, it's quite a rapid transition when you think about, you know, in terms of like the, 
entire field of DNA and, and what we Yeah, I just can't it. wait for the future. I mean, I see all the boundaries, I see the frontiers, and that's what I'm after, you know, degraded DNA, compromised mixtures. We did the first case with a mixture, uh, you know, uh, using whole genome sequencing. You know, all of those, uh, you know, real challenges that now, you, you know, for years we couldn't get around using CODIS or we were getting around. Genetic genealogy really is a powerful tool and we'll see a lot of that moving forward now. Yeah. Wow. Speaking of the future, so Ishii was virtual for the first time ever in light of the pandemic. Uh, what did you think? I, I love getting people's reactions to it. How did it work for you? You know, I, I actually have to say that seeing the calls on Zoom really made me feel I was almost talking to the speaker. I like that, you know, and I could see them and they were almost addressing me and I could get the details. I can look at them again. I'm very happy for that. The downside is I miss my friends. I've been going to Ishii for 10 years now, giving a talk or a poster every year. So I get to know people because if I'm giving a poster, somebody's going to walk by me, you know, they're going to come and find me. But if I give a talk, I find them. And, you know, even passing in the hall saying, oh, hi, you know, just bumping elbows or something. That's meaningful to me because I like people. I like to, I thrive in that, you know, being in person. I love that. And we can't do that now. No, we miss seeing each other and seeing you guys so much. This has really been wonderful to have this yeah. little moment at least. And Ish, I want to say they all did a good job in setting this up. It was, it ran. We had, it was almost like being in boot camp. You know, we had these different Zoom calls. Okay, you will do this. You will, you will turn on your computer at this time. You will go in the waiting room and, and we'll, we'll pump you with questions, questions before you get on. So. This time we push the red button and you go and you speak and then you push the red button and you stop. Okay, you got that? <laughs> and it worked. I'm glad it did. <laughs> Maybe it makes our video studio look a little less intimidating now. <laughs> no, it was fine. The informational content was very high, but the personal reaction, you know, was zero, really. It was very hard. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping we'll all be back together next year, you know, in, in Orlando, possibly. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, I, I think there's a chance since the conference is generally in September, October. If it was January, no. No, no. You know, September, October, mm, you don't know. Well, before we let you go today, is there anything else? Anything else you want to share with us? Anything we missed? Um, no, I just say, uh, you know, we're, we're humming. You know, COVID uh, hasn't stopped us. You know, check us out, Identifinders International, identifinders.com. Go and look at OSIG, sign up, make a comment. We're going to be sending greetings out and hello emails out this week because last week, obviously, it was so jammed. Um, and, you know, just be part of the community, ask questions, educate yourself, realize it's not, oh, my God, tool. It's really a practical, very powerful tool, and you need to know more about it. So you can write me. You can call me. Um, and I, one of the reasons we set this up my, from my point of view is I get calls, I answer the same questions a lot. You know, can I use my CODIS markers? You know, I get, still get that a lot. So we wanted to kind of put a place where we can answer everybody at one time. So join the discussion, you know, visit, visit us at identifiers.com and that's it. Give us, send us all your cases. We'll solve them all, maybe. <laughs> that sounds good. I'm sure that sounds very good to everyone. Thank yeah. you, Molly. And this is really wonderful. We appreciate it so much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for having me. This is great. See you next year. See you next year. That's right.